Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our class on apologetics. I'm sure some of you are worn out after listening to me lecture for an hour and 45 minutes on Islam. My apologies. A lot of other stuff comes up as we go on, but uh, everybody's very patient, so I appreciate that. Um, today, we are continuing our second class in apologetics. Today, I want to talk about the reliability of witnesses, especially the scripture, which is the foundation on which we base the Christian faith. People, as I mentioned before, people may say, well, Jesus is the foundation on which we build our Christian faith. And that's very true, but where do we learn about Jesus? It is in scripture. That is the testimony that was given us. And as the Holy Spirit inspires us to be able to understand it and receive it, it is the Bible that gives us the foundation for what we believe. So we're going to talk about today, uh, that today, depending on the time, I may get a little bit into the witness of the church, uh, the manifestation of the church. But before I get into anything else, let me open with a word of prayer. Our Father God, we're truly grateful to you for your grace and blessing. We thank you that you have given us a faith that is of our heart, but also of our minds. That you are a God who has not been silent, you have spoken to us, and that you have given us our reason. We pray that you would teach us to use it well and rightly. And that as we study apologetics, we would understand what it means to love you with our hearts and souls and minds as well. We commit ourselves to that and ask for your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Our class, last week we did an introduction to apologetics. I'm going to give you a couple of slides, as I always do, as we uh, get into it from a couple of slides from last week. Um, if you did not sign in, please do so at the break. I want to make sure that I keep an accurate... Uh, and if you're new to the class, if you didn't come last week, then you can go ahead and just write your name down and we'll catch up. Today are liability witnesses. The next two weeks, the existence of God, uh, one and two, and we'll be talking about logical proofs. This is sort of the uh, philosophical apologetics and uh, for God. And then creation, prophecy, and miracles. The risen Christ responding to the arguments and then applying the principles. We will then have the final exam. Um, around the fifth week, I will be giving you the what you need to know from this class, which is a summary of everything that I believe is most important from the class. And you can study that. I really recommend you study that because that, that, that is the core of what we should be learning. And then I recommend you take the test. You have to take the test if you're doing this for credit. But even if you're doing this for personal growth, which is wonderful, um, then I still think that taking the test, and studying for and taking the test, you will learn more. And I give you everything you need to know, don't I, everybody? Yes. Okay. I will tell you what all you need to learn. So that's our plan. I reserve the right to change that at any time as I'm preparing these lectures. Our biblical mandate, as I shared last week, 1 Peter 3 says, But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord always, and here it is, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. People often leave that part off. Um, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously about your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. One of the strongest testimonies we have is to live a gentle, respectful life, being clear of what we believe, and being willing and able to share that uh, reasonably with people. The fact is, throwing scripture verses at somebody who doesn't really understand or believe the Bible is not a believer. Um, is not going to do a whole lot to convince them. Apologetics exists in order to give a reasoned response so that people can overcome some of their preliminary objections and then be open to the Holy Spirit's leading. Um, R.C. Sproul, one of the great apologists and teachers in this generation, says the defense of the faith is not a luxury or an intellectual vanity. It is a task appointed by God that you should be able to give a reason for the hope that is in you as you bear witness before the world. The Lord has called for us to do this, to be prepared. This is why Jesus said the first and greatest commandment, he's quoting Deuteronomy, is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And yet most Christians stay stupid about their faith. They do not do the work necessary to learn why they believe what they believe. And if you don't have a church to go to, come to Lakeside Presbyterian because I'm preaching a series of sermons now on why we believe. This coming week, I'll be talking about why we believe in the resurrection. Um, in terms of apologetics, we can define apologetics as um, the discipline of defending a position, often a religious position, because you're going to have an apologetic of anything, but uh, to defend the position through the systematic use of information. Christian apologetics specifically combines Christian theology, natural theology, and philosophy. Now, Christian theology is the theology we derive from the Bible. Natural theology 
is to use in a right way our reason and our ability to observe the senses God gave us as we look at his creation. Scripture says if, we, if we're paying attention, then creation itself gives us a witness of God's greatness. Uh, and then philosophy, the rationality that God gave us, God gave us our reason to use, to present a rational basis for the Christian faith, to defend the faith against objections and misrepresentation, and to expose error within other religions and worldviews. There's actually one field of apologetics called polemics, which is the more assertive version. It means we initiate a critical evaluation of other religions and beliefs, whereas much of apologetics is responsive, where we respond to, to accusations of things. For instance, the first apologists, the early Christian writers, in the end of the early second century to the start of the third century, there's a group of the early church fathers who were called apologists because there were all these accusations that were being made against Christianity, especially by Rome. Because these Christians got together and ate the body and drank the blood of their founder, they were accused of being cannibals. Because they called each other brothers and sisters, even when they were married, then they were accused of incest. Uh, they would get together and have that love feasts, which uh, people who didn't know any better accused um, Christians of having orgies. And so all of these kinds of accusations, including accusations that they were not good Roman citizens, that they were against the, the emperor, etc., etc. Um, Nero accused the Christians of burning down Rome so that people wouldn't blame him for it anymore. All of those kinds of accusations. There was a period of about 100 years where a, a group of early church fathers specifically <laughs> responded to those things in a reasoned and sensible and eloquent way. They were called the early apologists. So this, there's a long tradition of this in the Christian faith. As always, if you guys have questions as we go along, you will let me know. Barbara. Um, in Craig's book, okay. William Craig, page 23, he says, I've even, I've even seen students come to Christ through hearing a defense of the Kalam cosmological argument. Right. Can you explain a little what that means? We will get into that. It's Kalam, is what you said. Um, it is... We'll get into that when we talk about um, the arguments for God, okay, evidence for God. The Caleb argument is a um, teleological argument. Now, what that means is the watchmaker analogy, that because of the existence of a watch, a complicated mechanism that does a specific task, um, that common sense tells us if there's a watch, there, there has to be a watchmaker. Well, that initially, William Paley, um, extended that to say that because the universe is more complicated by far than a watch, then it demands logically a creator. A more sophisticated version of that is the fine-tuning argument that some of you have heard me talk about. I preached a sermon on it, which says scientists have now identified over 200 different specific physical criteria that must be perfectly aligned in order for the universe to exist as it does in order for human life to exist. For instance, if the force of gravity were different by 1 to the uh, to 10, 1 over 10 to the 40th power, that's 10 with 40 zeros after it, if it were stronger or weaker by that tiny amount, then when the universe was created, the Big Bang, and again we're talking about scientists here, then either the universe would have caved in on itself or it would have, been, uh, it would have expanded too quickly for planets and stars to have been created. Now, why did I say all that? The Caleb argument is another version of the teleological argument, which actually goes back to an ancient Islamic argument, in which they use various pieces of the argument, the teleological argument, from design. That design, But the, the difference in the Caleb argument, and one of the reasons it's, and, and William Lane Craig is one of the great advocates of the Caleb argument today, is that it not only demonstrates evidence for God as you answer each of the questions of design in it, but it, it, more specifically, it demands the, the kind of God that Christianity believes in. Um, there are logical definitions within the answers of the Caleb argument, and it's more complicated than, than a lot of them. Not as complicated as the ontological argument, but we'll talk about that. Um, and so when we get into it, we will talk about that. We will discuss the Caleb uh, argument for the existence of God, and it, it, it's a kind of teleological Okay? I won't get into all of that right now. We'll spend the next hour on it. Um, any other questions? By the way, how did you do with the readings for this week? You had three books to read. 
did you oh, let me do it? Did you do well with um, Josh McDowell? Ready defense? Yeah. Pretty easy, right? Yeah. How did you do with the first 32 pages of Mere Christianity? You see, you see where he's going, right? Very sensible, logical. You can get you get a feel as you read that that this was done originally for a radio show, because the flow of it is very much like a spoken thing, um, and it gets even better as you get into it. But the idea of the moral law, the, the you know the law of nature and humanity is a we're going to talk about moral arguments later on, and Lewis was one of the real advocates that the very existence of a moral law demands a moral law giver. Otherwise, what are we comparing things to? How do we know that something is good versus bad, and that good is better than bad? Um, so, that's good. How did you deal with Craig? <laughs> this first part of it, when he gets into all the stuff about Boltmann and everything, this is the hardest part. Some of the delineations he makes, talking about Martin Bultmann and some of these other guys, um, is a little bit thick, a branch of that, and it, it gets a little easier later. But um, why he started with that, I don't know. <laughs> but, um, but we'll see. Okay, uh, Stay after it. It's good stuff. He is one, uh, William Lane Craig is one of the most respected, intellectually most respected uh, Christian apologists out there today. And you can see why. I, I once did a series of talks, a uh, class, called Really Smart People Who Believe in Jesus. And I've been thinking about repri uh, reprising that, doing it again, and uh, adding some people. And I think Craig might be one of the people I add. Uh, because I think he's, he and Alvin Plantinga, who I didn't do Al Plantinga in the first one either. He, Al Plantinga, single-handedly has reintroduced natural theology as a viable academic pursuit. And he is a very committed believer in Jesus. He is one of the foremost philosophers in the world today, and a Christian. Um, in fact, you might be interested, since we're talking about apologetics and philosophical apologetics, um, there are, there's a higher percentage of evangelical Christians in philosophy departments of universities and colleges around America than any other single area. People who think deeply about these things over the last 40 or 50 years have more often than any other discipline, philosophy, you know, because the idea is thinking deeply about the meaning of things, um, more of them have come to believe that the Christian faith is true than biologists or phys you know, physicists or whatever. That they do too. I'm not saying it's not for them. But the people whose whole job is to think deeply and clearly about the meaning of life and existence and you know, whatever, more and more of them are coming to believe that the Christian message is true. And in fact, the, the secular and pagan philosophers who exist out there, it drives them crazy. You know, that there's so many Christian philosophers working in academia now. So, I've just come up, I'm talking about all kinds of stuff. Today, I want to talk about the witness of Scripture. And I want to approach this by asking five questions. Again, because our faith is based on Scripture. Even if you don't start there, ultimately we have to come back to it. Because this is where God, this is the message God gave us. The truth. So, the, based on the kind of questions that people ask today, and again, we're thinking from, from a secular perspective even, what sorts of questions do we as Christians need to be answering? Because what questions are non believers asking, especially with the critics of the faith? Questions like, is the Bible textually reliable? Meaning, is the Bible we have today accurately reflecting the original Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek documents? Is there any evidence that the Bible is inaccurate in some way? Um, have there been changes made in the Bible through its transmission down through the centuries or because of tampering in the text to make it fit some theological bias or prejudice or whatever? Now, for those of you who are in the biblical interpretation class, you get to hear some of the stuff today twice because I'm going to use a couple of the same slides. We're going to get into some of the same things because a lot of people in this class are not in that class, so, uh, but we're dealing with the same kind of issues. So that's one. Is the Bible textually reliable? Is the Bible that we have today accurate to way, the way it was originally written by gospel writers Paul, Peter, James, um, John, etc.? Secondly, is the Bible historically reliable? Is there evidence that the scripture uh, accurately reflects real events in the past? If anybody could demonstrate that the Bible is just completely off base in terms of what it presents as being historical, um, the, the story of history, then we'd have a serious problem. Because we then would have a question of saying, is then how could God have inspired this? So what is the historicity or historical accuracy of the Bible? 
Is the Bible internally consistent? Or is it, as people often say, so full of contradictions you can't pay attention to it? You know, the Bible just contradicts itself right and left here and there. Is that true? Fourth, is the Bible relevant? Meaning, if it's accurate, um, does, it, does it make a difference at all? Does it have a history, particularly, of being meaningful in people's lives in real situations? Is it relevant? And finally, ultimately, is there support for the idea that the Bible is more than just a human document, but instead is truly the Word of God, which is what we as evangelicals believe is true? Okay, you understand those questions? Are you clear on that? Any questions about the questions? All right, this is a chart I used in a biblical interpretation class just yesterday. But the question of, <coughs> is the Bible textually reliable? Um, the two characteristics that allow, and, and here I'm not saying, is it the word of God? Or is it true? I'm just saying, is it accurate? That's the first question. Meaning, do the Bible texts that we have today in the Hebrew and Greek, translation is a different question, but do the Hebrew and Greek versions we have of the Old Testament and New Testament today, how sure are we, are we that they are what was originally written? Or has somebody changed them along the way? The two primary criteria by which we determine whether or not a document is, is accurate, reliably accurate to what originally was written, is the number of source documents that we have to compare and how close to the original writing is the oldest of the documents we have. Does that make sense? How many different sources can we compare to see if it's accurate and how recently after the actual writing was the earliest document we now have available today. So this chart gives you a comparison of ancient documents. If you look at the writings of Pliny, who wrote around 61 to 113 AD, um, the earliest copy we have of Pliny's writings is in 850 AD, which means it's 750 years after the original writing. Okay, you see how this chart is working? And uh, we only have seven copies, seven ancient documents by which to compare to see if what we have is accurate. So, Pliny wrote his stuff at the end of the first century. The earliest copy of his writing we have is, is 750 years later, and we only have seven ancient documents attesting to that. Right? Does that make sense? As you go down this chart, We've got Plato, Demosthenes, Thucydides, Euripides, Aristophanes, Caesar, Julius Caesar, that is, his, his uh, uh, Punic Wars, Tacitus, Aristotle, Sophocles, you recognize some of those names. You really ought to recognize all of those names. But um, in, in the homiletics class, we've been talking about the fact we need to read everything. We need to have a broad education. But these are playwrights, philosophers, poets, mostly Greek, some Roman, that are ancient documents. And you will notice that the original sort of dates of writing, the earliest copies we have, the time gap runs on this list 750 years, 1200, 800, 1300, 1300, 1200, 1000, 1000, 1400, 1400. I'm getting down before Homer here. Which means the closest we have of any of those, you know, the oldest text we have, the closest to the original is plenty, 750 years later. Most of them are 1,200 or 1,300 years or 1,000 years after the fact. And the number of ancient documents we have to compare to see how, you know, what the original looked like, 7, 7, 8, 8, 9, 10, 10, 20, 49, uh, 193 in the case of Sophocles. You see what that's saying? Remember, the two things, the two characteristics that tell us how accurately something has come down to us how many ancient copies of it do we have, and how close to the original writing is the oldest of those? <coughs> Homer, in writing the Iliad, um, wrote it in 900 BC. We have a copy from 400 BC, so that's 500 years, far less than any of these others. And we actually have 643 ancient documents of Homer's Iliad, which means we believe that we can reconstruct the original with a 95% accuracy, based upon 643 documents the oldest of which is within 500 years of when Homer wrote it. We don't actually know, you know, Homer's supposed to have been this blind poet. We don't know anything about Homer. That's all just legend. Now, compare that to the New Testament. 
The New Testament, written in the first century, some between 49, the earliest writing of Paul, and 100 AD. Some people say, you know, 80 to 90. I think 49 to 100 is the generally accepted evangelical view. People used to say, oh, this stuff wasn't written until 300 years later. One of the problems with people who say that, they overlook the fact that the Gospel of John, which they say wasn't written for like 250 years after John died, is quoted at the start of the second century by some of the early church fathers. How do they quote a document that the critics say wasn't written for another 150 years after that? That presents a problem. And there's not just one of those, there's a lot of places where it's quoted in the early church fathers. So even the more cynical of the um, biblical critics now are very reluctant to suggest what they used to say all the time, and that is that the New Testament documents Paul didn't write any of them, they were written 100 years later. John didn't write any of that stuff, it was written 200 years later, etc., etc. That very seldom is said anymore because the evidence doesn't support it. So, if it was written in the first century, we have documents that go back to early second century. New Testament documents. 130 AD, we actually have some fragments, like there's a fragment of the Gospel of John that is written 29 years after the traditional writing of John, in the first century. There is a new, um, you guys probably saw the report that it was mentioned in the biblical interpretation class, um, whereas the pharaohs and wealthy people in ancient Egypt would use gold and wood, you know, sarcophagi, poor people also put coverings over themselves, but they would make them out of found material, particularly papyrus, which was the paper of the day. Well, they have found the mask of a lower level person in Egypt when they uh, were x-raying, so they don't take these things apart anymore because they fall apart if they're thousands of years old. But they, they have one that is almost 2,000 years old, and in x-raying it, they apparently have what may be the oldest version of one of the Gospels, was used as filling material, <coughs> sort of like paper mache, you know, you plaster paper in there. X-rays have shown a piece of papyrus, which may very well be one of the earliest versions of the Gospels we have first, in the first century. So. We have documents that are less than, uh, quite a few documents, less than a hundred years after the initial writing, that is, ancient manuscripts of the New Testament, less than a hundred years after, and we have 5,686 of those. A hundred years within the writing, compared to 500 years, the next closest, which is Homer's Iliad, we have 5,686, the next closest is 643, which is Homer's Iliad, compared to... 10, 9, 8, 7. Critics dis vary in their estimate of this, but almost all critics now say that the New Testament Greek that we have is between 96 and 99.5 percent, certainly 96 to 99.5 percent, the same as what was written in the first century. If it, it, and so, in addition, by the way, to having 5,686 ancient Greek manuscripts as sources, there's another 10,000 Latin Vulgate uh, versions that were written very early, 9,300 other manuscripts written in Syriac, some of, the, some of the earliest versions we have, like from 150, were written in Syriac. Syriac is the written version of ancient Aramaic, which is what the what Jesus and the Apostles spoke. It's the version of the Babylonian language <coughs> because of the Babylonian captivity of the Jews. But by Jesus' time, a lot of people were speaking Aramaic as their common language. They learned it when they were in captivity in Babylon. But we have Syriac versions. We have various other translations. In all, we have in excess of 25,000 ancient documents that we have as sources to compare what the text says. In addition to that, the, the early church fathers, which begin around the end of the first century, the, Patric the, uh, the apostolic fathers, meaning the ones who knew the apostles and came right after them, in the writings of the early church fathers, which we still have, uh, there's no question about those, there are over 86,000 quotes in the writings of the early church fathers from the New Testament. We could con reconstruct virtually the whole New Testament just from the writings of the early church fathers from the end of the first century and the second century into the third century. So, in terms of attestation, meaning how well we can attest to the accuracy of the Greek and Hebrew versions we have today, 
There is no ancient document anywhere that comes anywhere close to being certain that what we have is what was originally written. Rich. I think you've convinced us, but let's say that somebody that we're talking with doesn't feel that the Bible, Old or New Testament, is reliable. How do we present this information to them in a, a logical well, manner? I present it, you can present it in one sentence. Obviously, I'm using more than one sentence. But you can say there are almost ten times as many ancient documents of the New Testament than any, than the next closest ancient writing. And those documents are within, we have documents within 100 years of the original writing, which is, uh, you know, is five times better than the next closest. Now, that's only, that only answers the question. It's not say, is this the word of God? Is it truthful or any of that? All it says is it addresses the question of, well, hasn't it been changed so much that we don't even know if this is what they originally wrote? Well, the answer to that is no, we do know that. In addition, it used to be very common for um, pseudo-scholars, you know, badly educated professors of bad small liberal arts colleges. I went to a good small liberal arts college, so I'm not slamming liberal arts colleges. But it used to be that professors uh, and supposed scholars would say, oh, well, you know, the Bible has been changed, the, the Bible writings have been changed so many times down through the centuries If we really had really ancient documents, and again, they don't, a lot of this stuff has been discovered in the last, you know, decade, in the last century. But they were still saying, oh, if we had the original documents, we'd know that it's been changed so many times and people have changed to say what they wanted to say, blah, blah, blah. Well, then we got to 1947, because they were saying this earlier in the 20th century. Actually, all of this kind of talk started, especially in the 19th and 20th century, with the advent of uh, uh, Protestant liberalism, especially German. I'm sorry about Lindt, he's not here. I have to poke him every time I say the German liberals. And then that's not because he's German. Um, well, the, in 1947, they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls are the um, Old Testament writings. They vary in date from 300 BC, that's three centuries before Jesus, to about the second century after Jesus. And in it, we have at least parts of every Old Testament book except the book of Esther. There are I think it's 19 copies of the book of Isaiah and multiple copies of others. And what they discovered is when they got these 2,000 or 2,300 even year old documents of the Old Testament and they compared them to what we have today, all of those scholars that said, oh, it's all been changed and messed up and da da da, there is virtually no difference between the Dead Sea Scrolls that are 2,000 and 2,300 years old and the 20th century, the 21st century now, Hebrew Bibles. That demonstrated to us that those people, not only the Jews, but the Christians that were responsible for copying the Bible, were, they saw that as the mission in life. God had called them to that. They did not make mistakes. They had systems in place. to So they carried, counted every character in every line, on every page, in every chapter, in every book. And any time they got to the end of a page, they had other people checking it to make sure they had the right number of characters, multiple people. And if there were one character too many or one character too, too few, they wouldn't use it. So they did not make mistakes. This is one of the reasons why we're convinced we have that level of accuracy. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, well, right now, about textual criticism, that, which is how you figure out whether it's accurate and how you compare things. I quote now William Fox Bright, uh, Foxwell Albright. Uh, William Albright was the world's foremost biblical archaeologist. He is still held in higher regard for his biblical archaeology in the Holy Land of the Middle East than anybody. He said, we can already say emphatically that there is no longer any solid basis for dating any book of the New Testament after around A.D. 80. I think 90s is more accurate, but he's even more conservative than I would be. Two full generations before the date, between 130 and 150, given by the more radical New Testament critics of today. The number one biblical archaeologist in the world, and he's not the only one, I'm just quoting him, are so quick to say nobody can legitimately say, this stuff is so late, so far off the mark, we don't know what it really said originally. That's simply not true. Okay? Now, why is this even an issue? The textual, uh, textual issues. Well, we get into what's called textual criticism. It used to be called lower criticism <laughs> as compared to higher criticism. Higher criticism deals with who wrote the book, when did they write it, where did they write it, where were they writing it from, and to. And it's the one that's really gotten us in trouble. 
the whole documentary hypothesis, which says Moses didn't write the first five books of the Old Testament, and on and on. But textual criticism, as it's called now, simply deals with do we have an accurate version of the original writing? So what I've been quoting you right now is a product of textual criticism. But the problem, the reason why we have to have textual criticism, and again, I've said this in other classes, criticism does not mean saying something negative. It simply means uh, analyzing something carefully and then expressing the results of that analysis. You know, a critic, like a, uh, a movie critic, he could say the most glowing things in the whole world. He's not saying anything negative, he's still a critic. Okay, that's his job. So criticism is a process, it doesn't mean bad or negative. Paul Mass, who is a textual critic, has written that the basic problem is we have no autograph manuscripts. Autograph means the original writing. Okay? When you sign an autograph, you know, that's, that's live, that's real, that's the original. So we have no autograph manuscripts of the Greek and Roman classical writers and no copies which have been collated with the originals. We can't take the original and sit down and compare it with what we have from later. The manuscripts we possess derive from the originals through an unknown number of intermediate copies and are consequently of questionable trustworthiness. We have to ask the question, validly, how, how accurate is this? The business of textual criticism is to produce a text as close as possible to the original. It's called a constitutio textus, you know, a constituted text, and a critical edition is another way to translate that. So the textual critic's ultimate objective is the production of a critical edition a text most closely approximating the original. So why don't we have the originals? Who is responsible for keeping that stuff that lost it? Well, the reason is because the, before the invention of the, and I should have brought you a cartoon, Barbara, before the invention of the printing press in the 1500s by Gutenberg, a movable press, everything, the only way you could have a copy of something was to, to hand write it. Barbara sent me a cartoon, and it's two monks one of the monks is sort of passed out over his desk, and the other monk's standing by him, and he yells, Printer's down! <laughs> <laughs> because that's how they printed it. They did it by hand. Okay? And, and there is inevitably small mistakes that are going to come into that. And so how do you decide what those errors are? Um, the reason why we don't have the original manuscripts, the autographs, is because they were written on either, most commonly, papyrus. <coughs> papyrus is reeds. It was invented, it, it's, you know, reeds that are taken, they're hammered out flat, and then they're overlaid with one another, and formed into sheets that you can write on. Well, it's a, a natural material made out of reeds. If it gets too dry, it crumbles up. If it gets too wet, it rots. The other thing that they wrote on was parchment. Parchment means animal skins. The very best parchment was vellum, which means it's a lamb skin. But they would tan the hide, scrape all the hair off, and all that sort of stuff, and then they would cut it in pieces and write on it. Parchment was very expensive, and even it can decay, because it's a natural material. It can rot if it gets wet. Or, you know, the inks they had didn't sit on it very well. So it gets wet, somebody spills the <laughs> Starbucks on it, and all the stuff washes off. So that's why the, the inherent uh, volatility of the original materials is why we don't have any of the original manuscripts, the autographs. And so the question is, how accurate were they as they went down through the centuries in copying that? Um, as I say, the discoveries, most recent discoveries, is they were astonishingly accurate. But some errors do creep in in any human process. You know, have you ever tried to you know, spend eight hours a day or a month just sitting and recopying something? You know, no wonder the printer's dead. <laughs> we do have two kinds of textual errors that have come into Scripture. Now, again, remember, when I say textual errors, these are errors of, of copying. But um, because we've got so many versions to compare, and there are rules called the canons of textual criticism that give guidance to the people who do this work as to how you decide. Is it this version or this version? Well, if you've got 47 of this version and one that we know came later of this version, then we've got a pretty good probability that we know what the original was. But there are other rules, like the, um, the simpler reading is almost always correct. Because while people sometimes would add things, it was very rare for them to take something out, unless it was just an accident of removing a word or part of a word. 
And so there are other kinds of rules that they follow to help make sure they're doing a, a good job of that. But some of the 95% of all the errors, textual errors, are unintentional and accident. And they include things like errors of sight, where somebody accidentally, a scribe accidentally makes a mistake <laughs> when he's looking at the original and copying it, looking at the original and copying it. It might be something like, um, you know, they look over here and they write a word, and then they glance back over here, and three words later, there was a word that has the same ending, and their eye picks up the wrong place. And so they leave out a word or two. Um, that's the sort of thing that can happen when they copy. But again, when you've got 5,686 ancient texts, we can see where those are and why they're not valid anymore. Second, errors of hearing. Often, when in monasteries where a lot of this copying was done, the abbot or a senior monk would read the Greek or the Hebrew if it was an Old Testament copy, and the various monks would write it out. Well, I used the example yesterday in biblical interpretation because we, you guess, some of you have already heard this, but it doesn't hurt you to hear it again. Um, the, the Moody Blues song and album. Knights in White Satin. You know that? Knights in White Satin. I'll do the whole song. <laughs> <laughs> For years, I thought that was K-N-I-G-H-T. I saw these guys on horses with lances wearing white satin whatevers. It's knights, N-I-G-H-T, as in night and day. Well, that was a textual error of hearing on my part. If I had written that down, I would have written it down wrong. That's an example that you can hear things wrong. The same thing is true in Greek and Hebrew as it is in English. Some words sound alike. Or, you know, so there can be errors in hearing. Errors of writing. Sometimes they simply would write down the wrong thing. Um, they would pick up, they, they would misread something and write it down incorrectly. Um, there then were errors of judgment. Sometimes scribes exercised poor judgment, especially in incorporating glosses. A marginal gloss would be <coughs> like if you're looking at the New Testament. <coughs> And there may be a passage that's a little more difficult to understand. Well, a previous, say a monk, an abbot, a theologian, a scholar, somebody, might have written a note in the margin. That's why it's called a marginal gloss. It's a, a gloss is an addition. And it may be just a few words to help understand what that means. Well, sometime later, you know, a, um, a probationary scribe monk, he's just starting his job, he sees that and thinks that that's actually a correction in the text. And so when he copies it, he puts that in when it was never intended to be part of the text. That's what we mean by errors of judgment in terms of adding glosses. Well, I'll get back to my big point in a in the second. We then have er intentional errors, which constitute no more than 5% of the textual variance that we have. Intentional errors include revising grammar and spelling over a period of time. You know. Even in Greek, they don't say things the same now that they said it back then. The grammar structure is different. Perfect example. If I were to say, um, hast thou motivation for running? You go, what? <laughs> well, that's in English. Over a period of time, language has changed. Florette asked me the question, we talked about this the other day. Well, how does it change? When did it change? It is always a very slow process. And new habits will develop, and it takes a long time for them to be, be picked up. Um, that's why the Oxford Dictionary of English Language, every year they publicize the words that they have added to the English vocabulary, that are new words. Well, some words drop off, and some words change their meaning. I'm sorry, you guys, some of you are hearing this stuff at the same time. Carolyn and I make jokes out of some of these because we'll watch TV. We were watching the show the other night, and it said, you know, um, well, the whole crowd was decimated. And of course, we think that means everybody got killed. Do you know what decimate means? One in ten. One in ten. It's, a, it's a Latin root because what the Romans would do is whenever a, a, a group of soldiers failed in their mission, instead of killing them all, because then you're losing all your you know, uh, guys, they would line them all up and they would count off and they would execute every tenth person. That was to decimate a group. And yet today, that has come to mean Everybody is dead. Language changes. Well, when monks were, or other scribes were writing this stuff down, they would come across something, and some of them made the intentional change, because they'd say, you know, that's a very old-fashioned way of saying that. Let me adjust that so that it sounds more like what we say today, so that people will understand it better. It's why we have modern translations that we read from more often than we do the King James. Okay? 
So, so, so Ross, how would you deal with, I mean, I've got friends that are King James only, and I'm a heretic because I read other mm -hmm. translations. I don't think I have a copy of the article, but I have passed out an article in oh. Biblical Interpretation, which, I have it in my um, okay. I'll get your really copy, Sam, okay. which gives all of the academic and, and sensible reasons why King James only simply doesn't make any sense. Uh, it's not, it's not King James only, the King James, I love the King James. Half the time when I quote scripture now, I quote from the King James because that's what I learned. You know, back before there was the NIV and everything else. Um, but the King James is not the best translation of the Bible because the best documents that we have of the, uh, the ancient, especially New Testament, were not available in the 1600s when they translated the King James. And so it simply is not accurate in places. And the idea of the textus receptus, the received text as the source of that, coming from Erasmus's translations and stuff, the, in the suggestion that that somehow is more godly when in fact it's not as accurate? I'm sorry, but that doesn't make sense. That's much of it. I'll get you a copy of that article. And if anybody else wants one, let me know. I'll bring some copies. What about the New King James? New King James is based on the same thing. All they did was same clean thing. up the language. Okay. The New King James is not a retranslation. It is a, a modernizing of the language, but with the same basis. Okay. Same problem. So revised spelling, grammar, and I did this beautiful, okay? There are times when I use the King James simply for the beauty of it. Uh, harmonizing similar passages. This is an example where they sometimes would go in and if a scholar or a scribe knew that there was a passage in another gospel, for instance, from what they were writing and it had a little bit more explanation or there were some words there that really helped, they would insert them where they're writing now. So the idea of trying to harmonize or make consistent with one another because the four writers of the Gospels were looking at things differently. They were different people. They had different vocabularies. And so the way they describe things are not always the same. Some scribes would try to make them the same. Eliminating apparent discrepancies and difficulties. I'll give you an example of that. Mark, in the first chapter, the second third verse, uh, Mark writes that he's, he's talking about some Old Testament writing. And he says, um, as it says in Isaiah, well, the, the passage he quotes isn't from Isaiah. It's from one of the other major prophets. The reason he did that is because in the same way Jesus, when he's talking about the, the Old Testament, Jesus refers to the, the law, the Torah, the prophets, and the writings is the category, but he says Psalms in one place. Because Psalms was the most popular, most important book in the writings, and often when they talked about the writings, they would just call it Psalms. Even though it's Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, uh, Job. Okay, so writers would go in and they would change, when he says Isaiah, because he wasn't quoting Isaiah, they would change it to say the prophets. That's an intentional change to try to clarify. Um, the next thing is adapting, uh, conflating the text. Conflating would be where you have variant readings, and conflating means putting, pushing them together. It's sort of like, are you all familiar with the Amplified Bible? Okay, the Amplified Bible is... It's the Bible, but they have put in every, you know, there are extra clauses everywhere. Sometimes in parentheses and sometimes not, because they want to give you every possible understanding of this thing. By pushing all of this together, you end up with something several times as long. But they're doing it to try to give better understanding, <coughs> including multiple different versions of something. That's conflating. Adapting different liturgical traditions. An example of that would be... Um, the, the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6.13, by the time, well, by the time the church was really up and running, they were using Matthew 6, the Lord's Prayer, as part of the liturgy. But they had decided in the liturgy of the church that when they do the Lord's Prayer, they added in the church liturgy, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever of it. That wasn't in the original text. If you read a good translation, it's not there. Well, some scribes said, well, that's really cool, and it's accurate, and it's beautiful, and let's go ahead and put it in. And so they added it. It's not in the good translations today. And finally, making theological or doctrinal changes. Absolutely the least common textual variant, and, all, and they have been caught, which means you make a change because you think there's a theological problem. An example of that in Matthew 24, 36. Jesus is being asked about when Israel will be you know, glorified, when the, when the Lord's coming back, when time will end and all that. And Jesus said, no one knows. Even the Son, speaking of himself, does not know the hour or the day, but only the Father in heaven. Well, the suggestion that Jesus, the Son of God, did not know everything was a problem for some of the early the translators, and so they took that out. They took out the part about not even the Son knows. 
Um, they shouldn't have, but they did. But the fact that we know that is an example. All of these variants, all of these possible changes, we know them. They're all obvious to us because of the number of texts that we have. And um, when we say that the text is 96 to 99.5 percent accurate, the parts that aren't, that we aren't sure about, have no theological implications. There are no doctrinal issues. It's not as though um, one of them is saying Jesus wasn't the Son of God and another one is. There are things like, do you spell color C-O-L-O-R or C-O-L-O-U-R? Is doctor abbreviated D-R, period, or is it spelled out? It's that kind of stuff. Somebody added a letter or took off a letter. There is no theological consequence to anything that we have any textual questions about. So anybody who suggests that it is not accurate today simply does not know the facts. Questions about that? Chris? Would these intentional errors um, be mostly in the New Testament and not in the Old Since Yes. Old counted all? Correct. It's almost all, there we're almost always talking about the New Testament. The Old Testament process, the Jews were much less likely than, than later than the Christians to uh, presume on the document. They took it as it was. Whereas, you know, some Christians thought, well, I'll help this a little. Jews would not do that. And so you don't get any of the intentional errors. Okay? I have a question. Yes. Um, we were talking to someone this week, and they, they quoted the end of, what was that, Mark? Mark. The end of Mark. Can you uh, comment on that? Yes. There are several places in the New Testament where there are um, what are called commas. It doesn't mean like a comma, like a pause. It means a section. It's a discourse. The end of Mark is one where if you look at any, and I did this the other day, and somebody actually pulled out their Bible. If you look at any modern translation, the last several verses of the book of Mark, which is the part where it says, you know, you can take out poisonous snakes and not be hurt. You can drink poison and not die. These are the verses that have been used for justification for like the snake handling, Pentecostals. Um, that passage does not occur in the most ancient versions we have. In fact, I think your, your version said it actually was introduced in the 5th century, the identified when. All modern translations will either italicize that or they'll put a break in there or, and or they'll have a footnote which says the most ancient scripts do not include <coughs> verses 12 to 18 or whatever. So whenever there is a serious question, now if, if there was something internally really off, it is possible by the whole power of the Holy Spirit to be bit by a poisonous snake and not die. It happened to Paul, you know, when he was being taken back to Rome. He reached into a fire to get a piece of wood and he was bitten by a snake. And they all went, oh, he's a goner. Nobody survived that. It didn't hurt him at all. Um, if you accidentally drank poison, God could save you. I don't think he gets real thrilled when we do it on purpose. But, <clears throat> so... They don't take it out because there's nothing inherently impossible or wrong about it, but because it's not in the most ancient manuscripts, they set it aside, and they'll tell you this is questionable. Another place, you might be surprised, is called the Johannine comma, which is the passage in John, the Gospel of John, where they bring Jesus, the woman caught in adultery, and they say, you know, this woman was caught in adultery, the law says we should stone her, what do you think? And Jesus says, well, let whoever's without sin cast the first stone. And he goes down and he writes in the dirt. And then one by one they all leave. And then Jesus of some says, where are your accusers, etc. That section is not in some of the oldest um, manuscripts we have. And so it is noted in all the modern translations that that's a question. It's not inconsistent at all with what Jesus would have said or everything else. And so they haven't just taken it out. Besides, it is in some of the ancient manuscripts. But they'll make a note of that, so that we're all aware. But this goes back, what did you say, to the 5th century. Well, just the one. It's like a new finding that's happened with the, obviously it wasn't affected by the Dead Sea Scrolls, because that was the Old Testament. But, um, right. Well, it, it, there, there's a case where 5th um, century, and I, I can't say this absolutely, but I think what I'm about to say is true. When they translated the King James, the documents they had were not the most ancient ones. They didn't have Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Alexandrinus, all of the major sources that we use today as the oldest and best sources. What they were using probably was after the, first cent the fifth century. And so they would have had manuscripts that would have included that, and they would not have known to make any note about it. And so 
One of the reasons those things stay in the Bible, too, is because people who are used to the King James, you take them out, and they're going to scream bloody murder. And so instead, because there's not anything inherently impossible about them, they're left in, but they're noted as not being in the old, oldest manuscripts, which we now have, that the scholars in the 1600s didn't have. Fair? Okay. All right. And going back to that, um, Mark uh, 16, uh, verses 17 and 18, it's, it's, uh, in some of the Bibles it's done as Jesus' own words, you know, where they do it in red. Right. I mean, that's pretty strong right. when they indicate that it's his own words. Well, I think the only thing they can do is acknowledge the fact that this isn't in a lot of the old manuscripts, but we also don't have, I mean, if we had uh, Justin Martyr, one of the apologists, or we had Irenaeus or Tertullian, if they had written, there was a heresy going around that someone has added this to the Bible and it's completely, you know, shouldn't be there, then we wouldn't include it. But we have no other evidence that it's not there and there's nothing inherently wrong with it. We can't read that and go, that's not consistent with the rest of Scripture. And so they put it in, but they make it very clear in all modern translations that there's a question mark over it. Okay? Fair? All right, I'm going to one more, do one more thing here, and then we'll take a break for a few minutes. The next question is, is the Bible historically reliable? Can we count on what the Bible tells us from history as being accurate? Um, a quote here from Nelson Luke, who is a Jewish archaeologist. He says, and I'm first, the first thing we do is look to archaeology. Arche, archaeology, whenever you look at ancient times, whenever you look at history, there are two different complementary disciplines of history. One is the written history. What documents do we have? The other is archaeology. What things can we find? Archaeology is very new. Archaeology, they're still finding stuff all the time. And, and the fact is that, interestingly enough, documents, because very few people could write in ancient times, documents always, al almost always represent a certain class of society. The New Testament is quite different in that because a lot of the people, I mean, Jews, could all write. But in most cases, written documents from other cultures, other than Jewish culture, only talk about the elite, because they're the only ones they thought were worth talking about, the only, they're the only ones that can write or read. Archaeology, on the other hand, almost everything they find in archaeology, well, not almost everything, but the majority of what they find in archaeology is from common people. The most common thing they find around the world are pieces of broken pottery. <clears throat> the rich drank out of gold and silver goblets, not, not clay pots. And so... Much of what archaeology gives us is the story of the common people. The two of them together complement and give us a three-dimensional picture as best it can. But archaeology, uh, again, the, quoting the Jewish archaeologist Nelson Bluth, in terms of a historical evidence, no archaeological discovery has ever controverted, that is overturned, a biblical reference. Scores of archaeological findings have been made which confirm in clear outline or in exact detail historical statements of the Bible. And by the same token, proper evaluation of biblical descriptions has often led to amazing discoveries. Some of the findings of ancient places has been because they followed the directions in the Bible. Okay? Um, so, the question, is it reliable? There are several... Right. I was thinking about the, about the ark and Mount Ararat back... I don't know, 30, 40 years ago, it was, it was pretty hot and heavy Huge. that they had found pieces or whatever on top of Mount Ararat. Right. Where, where does that stand today? Well, for the most part, just like finding findings in Saudi Arabia and findings in part of Turkey, which is where Mount Ararat is, <clears throat> um, they're very restrictive of who they let in there. Saudi Arabia won't let anybody in. Right. You know, questions about the location of the crossing of the Red Sea. Some people who have been over there for business or whatever, and they sort of just go for a whole a walk in the ground. They say there seems to be evidence for where the crossing of the Red Sea and the Exodus happened, but nobody can get in there to do anything official because it is a strict Muslim country. Turkey is 98% Muslim, and while it's a fairly open, fairly secular state, in terms of mounting an expedition, because the location of this is in a very room, it's up on the side of a mountain, it requires technical gear in places, you really got to know what you're doing to get up there, There's, you know, it's, it's, and they license it, you know, you're from Washington State, right? No, I... Uh, oh, sorry. sorry. Uh, oh, I guess I was thinking of Rich. If you want to climb um, any of the mountains in Washington State, you've got to get a, a permit. Mm -hmm. They restrict that. 
And they won't let somebody try to do a technical climb up Mount Rainier unless you can demonstrate that you know what you're doing. Well, for whatever excuse or reason, maybe legitimate reason, they have strictly limited the number of people who can go up Mount Ararat, which is a sizable mountain. The photographs, the aerial photographs that are taken, there's this wedge-shaped piece that looks like it's the mountain. Some people who did have permission to go up claim that they found core samplings of petrified wood. It's also true that, you know, whether it's, whether it's a biblical find or not, the government is reluctant to have a whole bunch of people going up there with backhoes and shovels and tearing the side out of a mountain. Okay? So, the main, re main problem is that they haven't allowed a lot of people to go up there. I will say, I had a friend, a guy that was a client of mine who became a friend, and he was really into this thing. You know, one of the astronauts was into this big time. He was like, uh, uh, Aldrin. I think it was, was it Buzz Aldrin or James Irwin? James Irwin. James Irwin. Yeah. Was very much into the search for that. Uh, and uh, this friend of mine got into it, and I said, okay, you know, I think it's, it's fascinating. It's cool. But why are you so into this? Why is this... In he said, it's simple. If we can prove that this was the Ark of the Covenant, or I'm sorry, that this was Noah's Ark, then millions and millions of people would come to believe in Jesus. And I said, no, they won't. Mm -hmm. It will be cool, and some people will start asking serious questions, but Jesus said, even if somebody comes back from the dead, they won't listen if they don't listen to the testimony that's already there, he says to, you know, to Moses and the prophets. Um, and I said, you know, it is cool, and go for it, and, you know, good on you, and gung-ho, and all that. But if you think this is going to be the thing that's going to turn the world to Jesus, it's not. Scripture tells us that. Jesus told us that. Mike. There's, I, my understanding was that Turkey was obstructing the, the expeditions up to Ararat because the Quran says Ararat is in a different place. Yeah, it's uh, Ararat is supposed to be in 200 uh, miles to the south. Yeah, so that's possible. I don't know. Okay, so archaeology supports and defends the idea, uh, the, the, the testimony of the Bible. James Mann of the U.S. News and World Report said, A wave of archaeological discoveries is altering old ideas about the roots of Christianity and Judaism and affirming that the Bible is more historically <coughs> accurate than many scholars thought. Dr. William Albright, who I quoted a minute ago, uh, as the foremost biblical archaeologist, said, there, is, there can be no doubt that archaeology has confirmed the substantial historicity of the Old Testament. Um, in Time Magazine, um, they wrote, well, I'll get to that one in a minute. I'll give you some examples. Hittites. What are the ites of the Bible? Amorites, Hittites, etc. The Hittites are presented in the Bible as having existed uh, back in, um, well, in ancient times, leading up to um, 1200 BC to up to the time of David. There was no archaeological evidence for them, and so skeptical scholars said there weren't any Hittites. This is something that was just made up and stuck in the Bible. Well, that was until the end of the 19th and early 20th century, in which they located a city in Turkey, which was the center, Anatolia, the center of the Hittite Empire, although they came further down into the Levant as well. And in that city, they found a library with tens of thousands of cuneiform um, tablets. They since have been able to establish that the Hittite Empire was one of the great empires of the millennia before the time of Jesus, that they were a major opponent to Egypt. In fact, that the Hittites in Egypt uh, at the Battle of Carchemish fought the greatest, um, one of the greatest battles in history. It was the greatest uh, chariot battle ever. And that the Hittite language is one of the source languages for Indo-European languages. And yet the skeptics said they never existed. And now... I teach classes on the world empires, and I give the Hittites a lot of attention. There's no question now, and yet everybody said it's not true, because it's only in the Bible. Um, the idea of Jericho, the description of Joshua and the Israelites crossing over the Jordan, getting to Jericho, and God tells them, march around the city once a day, and then on the seventh day, march around it seven times. Blow your horn, shout loud, and the falls of Jericho, the walls of Jericho, fell. Well, scholars, it, it's interesting. I listened to one scholar uh, on video that said, you know, Jericho, the walls of Jericho uh, did not exist at the time Joshua and the Israelites came in, that the walls of Jericho had been destroyed at least 250 years before that. Well, that's because she identifies the entry into to, uh, the Promised Land as being in the 1200s, not the traditional date of being in the middle of the 1400s, which is exactly when she said the walls of Jericho fell down. 
The fact that she's got a wrong dating, a, a more liberal dating for the entry into Canaan, <clears throat> creates all the problem. You look at it the other way and it fits right in. There is evidence the walls fell, that they were burned, but and that the city, at the time that happened, the city was not had not been under siege for a long time. All of the goods are still there. There are granaries, and yet the, God told the Israelites, don't take this stuff out of the city, leave it there. Well, it's still there. And all of the facts, again, there are some liberal scholars who argue with this, but there are a lot of scholars who say, even non-believing scholars, it seems to fit. And yet, they always said, couldn't be. City names and locations. The Bible is full of city names and locations that exactly line up with recent discoveries on that sort of stuff. For instance, in the Gospel, I don't think I have this in the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts, the writings of Luke, Luke names 32 different countries, 54 cities, and 9 islands. And so far, most of those that we didn't know anything about before have been confirmed as being accurate in location and description to what Luke wrote. In fact, a scholar, A. N. Sherwood White, noted in Acts, the confirmation of historicity is overwhelming. Any attempt to reject its basic historicity must now appear absurd. The Roman historians have long taken it for granted, people who studied the Roman Empire. It was believed that King David never existed because they didn't have any evidence for King David, the archaeological evidence. And then in 1993, um, they uncovered in Israel a tablet, a 3,000-year-old tablet with an inscription that identifies David as the king of Israel. And that verified it. In fact, following that, Time magazine wrote, The skeptics claim that King David never existed is now very hard to defend. Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate was said to be something that was made up. In 1961, a group of Italian archaeologists uncovered a limestone block it's Caesarea, which was the center of the Roman uh, control of the region, Caesar, uh, Caesarea Maritima. And this limestone block identified Pontius Pilate, prefect of Judea. The dating is right, the name is the same, the title is what the New Testament tells us it is. And everything fits, and on and on and on. Hezekiah's tunnel that brought water into Jerusalem was thought to be made up, and then they found it. Babylon. When they had found Babylon, they have found various inscriptions about Nebuchadnezzar and other things that line up exactly with what the Bible, the Old Testament says, uh, Book of Daniel and elsewhere. The Babylonian Chronicle verifies that the Babylonians did invade the southern kingdom of Judah, burn and destroy the city and the temple, and take the, the, the Jews back into captivity. Some people, scholars, had questioned that. The Pool of Siloam in, in Jerusalem, where Jesus healed the blind man and washed his eyes, has been found. Jacob's well, where Jesus met the Samaritan woman, has been found. The pool called Bethsaida, where Jesus told the man who had been laying for 38 years to take up his bed and walk, was hidden for a long time. It has been found. Herod's palace, where John the Baptist was imprisoned and killed, has been found, and is consistent with descriptions. A bone ossuary was found that mentions Caiaphas as being the Jewish high priest. That was the man who presided over Jesus' late night trial, and they, they questioned his real historical existence. And on and on and on. There has never been any archaeological evidence that plainly, now people make all kinds of stuff, that plainly counters scripture. The more they find, the more historically accurate the Bible appears to be. Let's take a break. There's one more thing I want to say about the historical reliability. And this has to do with simple logical veracity, in other words, truthfulness. Virtually every other religious or political document in history makes the effort to try to present the good guys, the heroes, the object of the faith as being, well, they're idealized. They are presented only in the best possible light, which makes sense if you're trying to sell a bill of goods. The Bible is the opposite of that. The Bible, in terms of historical reliability, just logical veracity or logical believability, consistently uncovers the sins of its characters, even the very most famous and important characters. King David is one of the three most important people in the whole Old Testament, and yet he is clearly shown as being sinful. You know, David Bathsheba, and he, he suffered. Solomon who uh, defied God, and therefore the kingdom was split because of that. Um, Moses, 
who didn't do what God told him, and as a result was not allowed into the promised land. The very best guys, you know, Abraham lied about his wife, said he, she was his sister, because he was afraid they hurt him. You know, who does that? Uh, Paul is, they tell the first part of the story of Paul when he was the epitome of evil. You have all these examples of the evangelists saying, Peter saying stupid things. It sounded like a moron. Um, and on and on and on. There is no attempt in the Bible to gloss over anything or idealize the main characters. Now, why would they do that? if there was not some historical believability and reliability in this text. It is unlike any other religious writing in that regard. Does that make sense? Um, it is a book that you can believe. Uh, C.S. Lewis said it very simply has the ring of truth when you read it. Okay. Is the Bible internally consistent? Which means, are there contradictions in the Bible? Um, give you some examples of this. So you can know what I'm talking about when I say contradictions, some of the accusations people make. And these may not sound like huge deals, but people make huge deals out of them. Um, how many angels were there at Jesus' tomb? Matthew 28 only mentions one angel. But you read John's account in the 20th chapter, and he says there are two angels. And people make a big deal out of that and say, plainly, that's a contradiction. Well, um, I, I used this analogy in a sermon recently, so some of you who heard this sermon will remember this. Probably won't remember it, but... <laughs> <laughs> I, I used the example, suppose Carolyn and I, uh, after a service one Sunday, we spoke to Bill and Amy Friend about stuff. And, you know, we have a good conversation with them, and uh, then later on, I bump into somebody at Super Lake that I know is a friend of Bill's, and I go, hey, you know, I had a good conversation with Bill yesterday at church. Well, Carolyn, the same day, bumps into that person, and she says, Ross and I had an opportunity to spend some time with Bill and Amy after the service yesterday, and we had a great conversation, and we're talking about doing some stuff together. Now, I only mentioned Bill. She mentions Bill and Amy. Is that a contradiction? Is it? Or is it maybe just that we were focusing on different aspects of it? One of the things that's true in a lot of Hebrew writing is that when multiple people were there and only one of them spoke, that one is the only one they would really acknowledge or refer to. And only one of the angels spoke at the tomb. The difference between a partial report and a contradiction, a false contradiction, people miss that. Just because all of the data is, is equally included in multiple reports in the Gospels, for instance, does not mean that one of them is wrong. In fact, um, well, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Here's another example. Was Jesus a carpenter, or was he just the son of a carpenter? Matthew 6 says Jesus was a carpenter. Matthew 13 says Jesus was the son of a carpenter. And people have made a big deal over the fact that that's a contradiction. Really? Is it not possible that he was both the son of a carpenter and a carpenter? In fact, is that not even a likelihood? Because historically, traditionally, boys often, quite often, took their parents, their father's, uh, vocation. And yet people look at that and say, Mark 6, 3 says he was a carpenter. Matthew 13, 54, and 55 says he was a carpenter. That's a contradiction. No, it wasn't. It simply is a difference in terms of um, what point they were wanting to focus on at the time. Another one that they make a big deal out of, in fact, this is one that, um, that Peter Jennings called a contradiction in a, on a television report when he was talking about this. Mark 15 says that uh, the issue is what time was Jesus crucified. Mark 15 says that Jesus was crucified at the third hour. John 19, 14 says that Jesus was appearing before Pontius Pilate about the sixth hour, which sounds like it's later, right? So how can Mark say he was crucified before um, John says he was appearing before Pilate? Well, there were multiple ways of telling time back then. The Jews started their day at daybreak. Usually that meant 6 a.m. That was just sort of the custom. So the third hour for a Jew, as Mark was reporting it, was 9 o'clock in the morning. John spent most of his life in Ephesus, a Roman city, before writing late in his, at the very, toward the end of his life, he wrote John's, uh, the, the, you know, some of his materials. 
So he had lived somewhere else for a long time. Um, and he lived in a Roman city. The Romans start their day at midnight, like we do. And so for, um, if you start your day at midnight, the sixth hour that John reports would have been 6 a.m. in the morning. It is very consistent to say Jesus was showing up before Pilate at 6 a.m. in the morning, the sixth hour by Roman time, and yet he was crucified at the third hour by Jewish time, which is 9 a.m. in the morning, three hours later. There is no contradiction. But the fact that people don't pay attention to the context and understand that sort of thing creates all sorts of accusations and all sorts of problems. Many supposed contradictions are instead complementary reports. They simply offer a different emphasis and perspective on the same basic event without either, either of them being wrong or untrue. Frequently is a lack of understanding of the context. If the Gospels all said the same thing in the same way, they would immediately bis be discounted on the grounds that they had secretly harmonized their writing in order to try to sell a bill of goods. You ask any, anybody involved in police work, a detective, a police officer, and they're interviewing witnesses. If they get two or three or four witnesses that say exactly the same thing in exactly the same way, what do you think they're going to say? Mm -hmm. It's not believable. They're lying. Because people don't see exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. the, four, the reason we have four Gospels, especially the three synoptic Gospels, the same seeing Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, is here are three people who either witnessed it themselves, uh, or were first-hand witnesses to the testimony of someone who did Luke, traveled with, with Paul, and then later interviewed everybody. He's, Luke is the one who says <coughs> Mary you know, treasured all these things up in her heart. How did he know that? Because he interviewed her. And he says, I talked to all these people. Mark worked with, Paul, with a Peter, and so Mark presents Peter's first-hand witness of that. But they're all looking at the same scene from the opposite direct, from different directions. And so they'll focus on different aspects of it, not contradictory, complementary. And the fact they're not exactly the same actually is one of the things that tells us it's likely true. Somebody didn't go in and make them all say the same thing so that it seemed like it was consistent. That is a sign of truthfulness. So I don't think there are huge contradictions in the Bible. There are some things we read very, very openly, honestly, and we say we don't really see how that's the case. It's not contradictory. It's not obviously untrue, but there are some things that we have, we're have we puzzled about. There are some questions I look forward to asking the Lord when I see them. Okay? But there are no obvious contradictions. There are no clear untruths. People who say that are just parroting something they heard someone else say. And, you know, as Carolyn, we were just talking about our, our Egyptologist friend on the last cruise. When someone says, oh, the Bible is full of contradictions, in a friendly, non-threatening way, to be gentle, can say, oh, look, what are, what's one of them? Can you tell me one of the obvious contradictions in the Bible? And if they come up with one of these, or something else, then to think in terms of maybe it was just the same event, truthfully told, but from different perspectives. Or maybe there's a context there that we don't fully understand, like the time difference. Um, but 99, 999 times out of 1,000, if you say, well, what is, what is one of those contradictions? They will not be able to give you an answer because they're only saying something somebody else told them because they thought that was the cool thing to say. All right? Um, comment or question about that? Let's talk for a minute about, is the Bible relevant? Does it make any difference? What reason would we have to think that this is going to make a difference? Well, the first part of what I want to talk about doesn't prove anything, but it's a, it's, I think it's, there's a burden of, of evidence here about the importance and relevance of the Bible. And that is, the Bible is by far, and I think you know this, the most published, the most read, the most translated, the most influential, and the most cherished book in history. Nothing else comes close. Now, why is that? Unless somebody seems to think it's important. Somebody seems to think it's relevant. The Bible so far has been translated into 2,530 languages, 531 of those with complete texts of the Bible, 1,715 either with a complete Old Testament or New Testament, and 55 sign languages. 
there is a Klingon Bible. <laughs> Which means somebody's got way too much time on it. <laughs> now, the, the difference between the number of languages and the whole Bibles, uh, in, in when they just when they're just beginning with a new language study, and there are groups like Wycliffe and Tyndale, you know, Tyndale sponsors them. Uh, Wycliffe is probably the greatest and best known. Some of the Bible societies as well have translation efforts. When they start with a new language, and they're getting down to the small languages now, where they're not big people groups there. When they start with a new language, they will start often with the Gospel of John. Because the Gospel of John is a, if you got nothing else, that's a good place to start. Or sometimes the Gospel of Mark, which is the shortest and probably the simplest and most direct story of, of Jesus' life. John being the theological interpretation of Jesus' life. So, but the significance of that. Now this book, this book was written over a 1500 year span in three languages, predominantly two, Hebrew and, and Greek, but there are some passages in Ezra, in Daniel, and a little bit of Jeremiah that are written in Aramaic. Daniel is almost half Aramaic, because he was living in Babylon at the time, and Aramaic is Chaldean, it's the ancient Babylonian language. Um, it was written by over 40 authors from all different walks of life, kings, peasants, philosophers, fishermen, etc., etc. Um, it was written in a lot of different locations on three different continents, you know, Asia, Europe, and Africa. Um, the diversity in this thing is astonishing. And yet, this is Professor Ian Montiero Williams. He is the uh, Bowdoin Professor of Sanskrit. He is one of the foremost experts, or he was when he was a professor, of ancient uh, Asian languages. And so he knows the ancient Eastern writings. He said, pile them, that is the Eastern holy books, if you will, on the left side of your study table, but place your own holy Bible on the right side, all by itself, all alone, and with a wide gap between them. For there is a gulf between the edge, that is the Bible, and the so-called sacred books of the East, which severs the one from the other utterly, hopelessly, and forever. A veritable gulf which cannot be bridged over by any science or religious thought. The Bible, throughout its history, people have died to translate it. People have been imprisoned, some of them for life, for just trying to get it, smuggling it into places where it's not available. <coughs> Anybody who does not think the Bible is relevant when they look at the way it has motivated people, the way it has changed people's lives, are not paying attention. There is no other book ever that comes anywhere near close having the obvious relevance in people's life that the Bible does. And when people pick up the Bible and they start to read it and they go, oh, this is awful, I don't, under I don't understand this, I'm bored, I'm going to sleep. Um, I, I recently, and I quoted this in the other class, recently read a, a little sort of parable by D.L. Moody, and he said there was a woman who picked up a book to read, and she read the first couple of chapters, and she was really bored with it. She didn't, it wasn't interesting, she didn't care about it, so she set it aside and read the rest. A few weeks later, through a group of friends, she meets this man, and they like each other, and they start seeing each other, and she finds out he's the author of that book. <laughs> and they end up getting married, and after they're married, she picks that book back up again, and all of a sudden, it is the most wonderful, interesting book in the whole world to her. Why? Because she was in love with the author. For many people, their inability to get anything out of the Bible is because they don't know, much less have, are in love with, the author of that book. And for many people, the issue of them not being able to get anything out of the Bible is they need to step back and say, what is my relationship with God and who is the author of this book? And that might make all the difference in the world, especially for them. Okay, does that make sense? Um, I can honestly say there were times in my life when I struggled with the Bible, and now I truly love it. And, and it doesn't have to be a huge amount of work. Again, Carolyn and I have developed a discipline. We, I get up first, usually, not always, but usually, go downstairs, feed the dog, you know, give him his yogurt, because he has to take medicine, and the vet told us to give it to him in yogurt. So give him his yogurt, that's his breakfast. And then I sit down with the, I have the NIV study Bible on my Kindle, and so it always keeps track of where I was. 
And if I want to look anything up, I can, but it still it reads without all those notes. And I sit down and I just read. And I read starting where I was, and I read until I feel like that's enough. I am not trying to break any records. I am not trying to read everything in a month or in a year. I'm not trying to say, I have to read Old Testament and Psalms and New Testament every day. So many times people put that kind of burden on themselves, and they ruin it for themselves. Now, there are times when I do more intensive Bible study. I hope that's obvious when I preach and things teach, you know, teach Bible classes. But for the most part, one of the things that we miss is just reading through the Bible and letting God tell you its story so that you can grow in understanding what God's message to humanity has been. I sit there with a cup of coffee and I read, and Carolyn comes down and she sits down and she takes out her Bible. And because I do a lot of other studying and writing at other times, I don't even, I don't even keep a journal or log on that. Carolyn does every morning. Um, but I'm, I'm doing my sort of logging when I do the study and writing sermons and writing classes. But people who don't get the Bible, maybe it's because they're coming from the wrong perspective relationally. Okay. Um, is it possibly the Word of God? One of the things that we need to recognize is there has been no book ever that has been as opposed as the Christian Bible. When I say the Christian Bible, I mean the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament. Um, it has been viciously attacked by enemies like no other book. The, it has been burned, it has been outlawed, uh, it has been, again, people are thrown in prison for smuggling it, and yet it continues to grow. It continues to be there. There is something about this book that will not die. Bernard Ram says, no other book has been so chopped, knifed, uh, sifted, scrutinized, and vilified. What book on philosophy or religion or psychology um, or bell letters of classical or modern times has been subject to such a mass attack as the Bible, with such venom and skepticism, with such thoroughness and erudition upon every chapter, line, and tenet? The Bible is still loved by millions, read by millions, and studied by millions. There is something about this book that will not go away. I believe it is truly the Word of God. Um, Voltaire, the <coughs> great skeptical <coughs> philosopher, of um, naturalist philosopher from France, he said within a hundred years that Christianity and the Bible would be swept from history. It is a fact that 150 years after Voltaire, the Geneva Bible Society purchased his shop and used his printing press <laughs> to print Bibles. <laughs> Okay. He had a printing press because he printed all of his own pamphlets and brochures and, you know, philosophy and skepticism and all that kind of stuff. The Bible will not go away. Um, and there is something miraculous about that. I think, too, one last thing I will say, um, and then I'll take any questions or whatever. I'll finish with it. Um, is there is something, when we talk about the Bible as the Word of God, there is in Scripture a unity that no other book has. Again, written 66 books, written over 1,400 years by more than 40 authors in three languages, on three continents. By any other standard, that would be all over the map. Okay? And yet, from Genesis 1 to the end of Revelation, as you study it and learn it, and in the Bible interpretation class, I actually had an, a, a, a list of the major events of the Bible, because we need to know the story. We need to be able to say, what is the story of the Bible? Throughout all of that, there is one unified story, one message about the God who created the universe and then created humanity, expressed his special love for humanity and calling one people to himself to be his messengers. The call to Abraham was, I will make you my people, you will be a great people, I will give you a promised land, and through you I will bless all the peoples of the earth. The exclusive call of the Israelites was so they could be the mouthpiece God would use. He reiterated that, that I will bless all people through you to Isaac, to Jacob, and down through the prophets. Um, so there is a unity throughout all of it. And a unity not because they, the Bible only addresses the simple stuff. The Bible dares to address things that nobody else, everybody else is afraid to even talk about. How did the universe come into existence? Does God exist? If he does exist, what is God like? Why does humanity exist? And where did we come from? And what's our purpose? You know, 
sort of why are we here? What's our purpose for being here? Why is there evil and suffering in the world? What happens to us after we die? Don't you think those are kind of big questions? Those are the kind of questions you're not supposed to talk to people about at the barbershop. <laughs> you know, some things they say, don't talk about religion or politics, okay? The Bible addresses that stuff head on. All of life's most difficult, most controversial questions, and in the process of addressing those impossible issues, it changes people's lives. No less than that. It changes people's lives. I think if there's going to be a word of God, that would be a pretty good description for it. God's own message to us. Is that fair? Okay. Um, any questions about any of that? Again, today is about... I, I, the other thing that I was thinking about talking uh, about a little bit is the witness of the church. I actually, when we were on the last cruise, the CEO chairman of the company was there, and we got to talking, and we sort of hit it off, and, and he started asking me questions, and one of the questions he had was, well, are there any other documents besides the actual New Testament from that time that verifies that they were actually telling the truth about this? My answer was no. I mean, there are, doc there are sources, um, Jos Flavius Josephus, Suetonius, Tacitus, uh, various others, the Talmuds, uh, writing in the Talmuds, that verify that Jesus was real and he was alive. But in terms of making the case for them, I said no. But the thing you need to realize is, at the time of Jesus and his apostles, and for 300 years after Jesus, there was no upside to being a Christian. There was no political advantage, there was no financial advantage, there was no reason you would say this stuff unless you absolutely were convinced it was true. In fact, most of the early followers of Jesus died pretty horrible deaths because they insisted on telling what they knew to be true about Jesus. And sometimes we miss that. The very fact that the church existed and grew, that within 50 years of Jesus, the church had spread not only throughout the Middle East, but into North Africa, into all of Asia Minor, because of Paul, into Europe, you know, the parts of, of uh, Greece and various other areas, Thrace and whatnot, and all the way to Rome. There were pockets of Christianity all over. And that was within 50 years, without any of the mass communication, without any of the mass transit, or any of the other kinds of things we take for granted today. And that was because these people, even during a time when the Jews and the Romans, first the Jews and then the Romans, were persecuting uh, these Christians, Everybody had to tell what they knew absolutely to be the miraculous truth they'd experienced. There was no upside. The apostles, the only, the only apostle that died, you know, much of this is traditional, but it's traditional in the writings of the early church fathers who reported this fact, the only apostle that died a natural death was John. The early church fathers report that the others were hacked to death with swords, crucified, crucified upside down, cast off cliffs, boiled in oil, fed to beasts, and on and on. And yet, they did not renounce their faith. Why would they do that? You know, somebody might lie about something, but will they die for something they know not to be true? That many of them? The very existence of the church is itself one of the witnesses that is a testimony for the truth of the Christian faith. And that is a very valid apologetic, I think. Fair? Questions about any of that? <clears throat> for it. Um, is it possible that that the um, the people being against the Bible is just because of the New Testament? I mean, is the Torah subject to the the same <coughs> where people you know don't want to hear about it as it is for what we call the Christian Bible? It's always even more so because of the Jews being the most persecuted people that have ever lived, um, and so when people see that the Torah, which technically is the first five books, but it's used to refer to all of the Tanakh, all of the Hebrew Bible. Um, when they see that as the document of the Jews, and they hate the Jews, then they hate their book. Mm -hmm. And so in many ways, there's a stronger prejudice um, against the Hebrew Bible than there, there has been the New Testament. I can't say there's more, but there's a different motivation that has made that just as vociferous. Um, and so, yeah, all of the Bible, the Hebrew Bible by itself, the Christian Bible by itself, or all of it together, have been the object of much persecution and uh, suppression. Other questions? 
Yes. Yeah. I, I just um, remembered something. Uh, some of the most evil people in the world try to find out more about the Bible to use it to their advantage, or to. I'm thinking of Hitler. Did he not try to find the ark, or find the? the did he not try to find something? Or that was that Indiana he, Jones. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I actually thought that there were. Some well, um, not real Christianity. Now it's true that Hitler and especially. Um, Goebbels and some of the others um, were huge into the occult, and they included in the occult what they thought might be. They thought there might be some magical powers to some of the ancient Hebrew artifacts. Um, the reason why they're called the Aryan race, the Aryans were from India. Well, the Nazis mounted huge campaigns into the Himalayan mountains to try to find out this occultic practices from the ancient Aryan peoples and others. So uh, there was a huge part of that, and they created um, various sort of secret societies, cultic secret societies, that would um, try to pursue, and, and there was a lot of that. If they had any interest in Christianity, um, then it would entirely have been because they thought there might be some power to be derived from that. But there were, they were in a way, in fact, one of the things that Hitler was, you know, that Christianity has been accused with is, well, Hitler was a Christian. Not by any definition of that term that would make sense to anybody. You know, he wasn't Jew. If you mean by Christian that he came from a Christian nation and wasn't Jewish, that's the only way you could define him as that. Because there was no practice, there was no history, there was no testament, there was no testimony, there was no nothing. So the, the idea of blaming Christianity because Hitler was Christian is... There's no, there's no way you can support that. Yes. Well, how do you answer the question? And, and just, just recently, uh, the Pope was in, the, I think, the Philippines, and, this, and after a storm, and a little girl asked him, "If God is a loving God, how, how can He let horrible things happen to such innocent people?" Mm -hmm. I mean, how do you answer that? Well, we're going to deal with that later in the sermon and later in this class, but I will give you a short version of the answer. Um, first. The idea that God did it is not accurate. Uh, some people would say, you know, God's in control of everything He did this. When God created um, Adam and Eve, He created them for the purpose of being, being in relationship with Him. All right, that's why that's the hunger that is in every human heart is that human beings were made to be in relationship with God. And until we figure that out, that that's what we really want, we try to fill that that vacuum, that hole with money and cars and vacation, you know, whatever else it is. Okay. We were made for a relationship with God, Adam and Eve, that was the case. Well, you can't be in a real relationship with somebody if they don't have a choice, right? They have to be able to choose to love you. You can't make somebody love you and have to be real love. That would have to be a robot. Um, and so God created Adam and Eve with free will so that they could freely choose to receive his love and to be in relationship with him. Well, by creating a world in which there was choice involved, Adam and Eve could choose to love God and honor the relationship, or they could choose against God. And they did exactly that. Eve chose to betray God's trust, to violate the relationship with God, and that was when sin and evil and suffering entered into the world. Not because God made it, but because for good reasons, God made a world where that was possible. And so all of creation fell when Adam and Eve fell, when they chose to violate and betray the love of God. The first thing that God did for Adam and Eve, after he recognizes their sin and said, who told you you were naked? Because they covered themselves with, with uh, leaves. Who told you you were naked? And he talked to them about it, what the consequences were. What was the first thing that God did after that? Made them clothes. He made clothes out of what? Animal skin. That's where death all of creation fell, death entered, the creation is fallen. Now, there's no real clear explanation for creation has fallen, and part of that is that there are natural disasters. There are earthquakes, there are tsunamis, there's all of that. I'm not prepared to say God is not in control of all of that at all. You know, that's, that's deism, to say God is apart from that, he's not running things. We believe that God is still sovereign, he is still in charge of the world. But the existence of those things is part of is our fault. 
It's the result of sinfulness on the part of humanity. The thing we need to understand is that God, uh, sometimes when evil things happen, and we say, how could that be? Why is that? It sometimes is because we simply don't understand enough. We don't see clearly enough. We don't see far enough to understand what God is doing here. And it looks awful to us. Um, I've told the story before, and it doesn't sound as bad as a, you know, as a nature storm, but Corey Ten Boom, in her story, you know, the, the hiding place, she talks about the fact that her family, Corey Ten Boom was Dutch, and her family were hiding Jews, and they got caught by the Nazis, and they, several of the family members were killed, others were sent to concentration camps. She and her older sister were sent to Ravensbrück, the concentration camp, women's concentration camp. And they went into um, the barracks, and they very quickly discovered that the barracks was full of fleas. And they were both committed believers, and so Corey said, how could, how could fleas possibly be part of God's will? What in God's plan could make fleas good? And her sister said, we don't always understand these things. Well, later on, they discovered that one of the women in that barracks had a copy of, had a new, at least a New Testament, maybe an old Bible. And they would gather together and read from God's Word and encourage each other and share. Well, the only reason they were able to do that is because the guards would not come in that barracks because of the fleas. And so their comfort, their encouragement, their sharing the Word of God, them sharing the truth of the Gospel with each other was entirely because of those fleas. Now, that's, a, that's one example. Often, we don't understand. I mean, we look, at, we look at a death and we say, what could possibly come from that? We don't know how God might use that. In the life of someone else, in the flow of history, we simply don't know. We don't know what God might do. Is it that God will use this to call forth acts of, of compassion and through that people might see his love? Um, you know, they asked Jesus about a man born blind. Was this man uh, born blind because of his sin or because of his parents' sin? Because the Jews thought if somebody had a disability, it's because somebody sinned. Jesus said, neither, but so that the glory and power of God might be shown forth in him. We don't know how the, always that works, and yet it very very often is. So part of our response to that has to be simple humility. We don't know. God does limit suffering. God, God, all through Scripture and through our own lives, God limits suffering. Who do you think has given the wisdom to human beings to develop any of the treatments we have? Praise God for aspirin. Okay. Um, God gave us the ability to discover that. I think sometimes he actually drops stuff in our lap. God cares for us. He limits suffering. But the, in the book of Job, Satan was limited in what he could do to Job. Mm -hmm. But the ultimate response, the final response in terms of, doesn't God care? Doesn't God understand how much this hurts? Doesn't God care what happens to us? Is found on the cross. Because God loved us enough God was sympathetic enough to our fallenness and our sinfulness and our brokenness that He Himself and His Son came to earth and He suffered every sin and temptation and pain and grief that we can suffer except without sin. He was betrayed by His friends. He was brutalized by beating. He was humiliated by His captors. He was nailed to a cross, one of the most horrific ways ever to die. I don't think we've ever come up with a worse way, a more painful, slower way to kill somebody than crucifixion. So much so that the Romans refused to even talk about it. And anybody in polite society in Rome would not mention crucifixion and certainly would never witness it. Uh, this is even during the time of Jesus. It, it couldn't be used on a Roman citizen. Jesus went through all of that. Why? Hebrews says that he made himself like us, suffering everything that we can suffer, so that we know we do not have a great high priest who is not sympathetic to our weakness, but rather one who, like us, has suffered all of this. So God cares. He has demonstrated he cares. He's limited pain and suffering in the world in many ways. He has demonstrated his sympathy for us in that by the death of his, the torment and torture and death of his own son. And then we always have to remember, God, it's not God's fault that most of this stuff happened. Suffering came into the world because of the sin of humanity. And that wasn't all that short. That was the short one. <laughs> <laughs> but mostly it's just we simply don't know. Yeah. We have evidence that God is a loving God. A lot of evidence. 
That is demonstrated to us, and we have that as a foundational platform of our faith. And beyond that, we have to confess humility that we don't understand all of that. In fact, most of the truly great saints in history have suffered terribly. Paul, three times I went to the Lord and asked him to take away this thorn in my flesh, which we're not even sure what that was, but we believe it's probably very bad eyesight because there's other hints of that. And he said, and every time the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you. In our weakness, we are made strong. In our very suffering, we are made what God wants us to be. Okay, that was sort of a sermon, rather. So you can go <laughs> Any other questions or comments? I appreciate it very much, everybody. Thanks for being here. We will see you next week.